put a step change in, or usually a series of step changes, and observe what comes out. Okay, so here's your input. You know, I'm kind of plotting this in physical variables. So here's some input, and then at some time you change it to some higher value. Right? The output, in principle, you know, might do something like this. I don't know. Okay. And now you want to build a model between the two of them. Um, the point is here, you have to move the input around. Otherwise, the output won't move around. If, if you don't change, move the output, you'll never build a relationship between them. We're not interested in a steady state model, we're interested in a dynamic model. Okay, so we have to collect this data as it changes with time to build the model. OK. Um, and so the idea here is we typically want the simplest model possible. So that's why we try to <coughs> often distill everything to be like first order plus time length, which is nothing much simpler than that. OK, so a few caveats here. Um, the model is only going to be any good over the range of data where you collect it. I didn't come out right. The model is only going to be a uh, reasonably accurate representation of the process over the range of tests that you perform. Right? So if this is a change of some flow, or let's say this is the reflux flow between 5 and 8, I'm just making up numbers. I wouldn't want to use the resulting model for refluxes that are around 1, because I, I don't know if the model even works there. Because there's no fundamental basis to the model. Right? If you don't have data there, you wouldn't want to operate it there. So you have to do these tests over the range of data or the range that you're sitting operating at the plant. Okay? Um, and typically, there's no real fundamental knowledge gained from doing this. Okay? Um, it's unlike doing, let's say, more fundamental modeling. All right? OK, so here's how you do it. So I've been involved in projects like this. So these can be you know, simple projects, like if you had this case, reflux ratio overhead composition. Then you might collect data for a couple of days, you know? and then do your thing. I've been in uh, tests where you're building a really big controller, which means you've got a single control to control the whole plant. And this might be nine weeks, 24 hours a day, testing. Because in a real plant, you might have 40 inputs and 60 outputs or something like that. Okay. So in a, in a real plant test, this can be a very um, demanding job. And I think I mentioned to you that if you're in a plant and you want to do something that's a couple days, you can just do it. But if you, you can't just launch off on some project takes six weeks without telling anybody. Okay. And then there and you know how it works, right? Then the people say, How much money will it make? And then you have to estimate that, oh, we'll reduce variability and that's going to save this much money, and then they subtract and do a cost analysis and you gotta like you gotta make the money back in a year or two, right? It's no good to make it back in ten years. Because no one no one even works, they'll be there in ten years, right? All right, so we do something like this. Generally, first of all, formulate your objectives. Like, what are you trying to accomplish with the model? I need a simple model to control the reflux, manipulate reflux to control overhead. Simple. Okay. I need a big model to operate the whole plan. That's a whole different thing. Select the inputs and outputs. So, for the problems we talked about in this class, those are pretty straightforward. Because I already told you for this example, it's reflux and overhead composition. But if you were trying to develop from the ground up, a controller for a big piece of a whole plant, these choices are not obvious. And we'll talk about that at the end of the class. OK, develop a plant testing plan. Okay. That means before you do any tests, you have to have a plan. You just can't go in there in one morning and start screwing around with stuff. I saw a guy at Exxon get fired for that, actually. So what do you have to do? You have to go into a room with the operations people, and you have to tell them, here's my plan. Because you see this plan is making product. Is operating. So you can't just go in there and screw around with the reflux, and then the, the product gets off specification, and the operations people are, what are you doing? Let the plant test. Why? I forgot to tell you, sorry. Um, so this is kind of um, a compromise between your desire to collect information and the, and the operations people's desire to have you have no information, right? Because they don't, they want everything to be lined out at steady state. They don't want you to come in and perturb the plant. So. You have all this has to be done with the operations people. Okay. All right, so then you collect the data. Okay. So you've got this data set. You know, if you were wise, you wouldn't do this one time. You would do this maybe three or four times in the hopes that 
you get some good data, because one time is probably not enough. All right. So you analyze the data, which means you look at this data and see if it makes sense. Like, should this go up if this goes up? You might be surprised. You might know that this comp so this is the reflux, right? To increase the reflux, the composition will go up, right? Okay, so you know that. But sometimes the output will go in the opposite direction you think. You're like, well, something's wrong there, right? Then you go to the operations people and like, you go, what were you doing last Tuesday at 3 o'clock? And they're like, we were changing a valve on the distillation pond. You're like, the reflux valve? They're like, yeah. <laughs> You're like, okay, throw the data set away. Okay. So my experience is, you know, a quarter to a third of the data is bad. It just isn't good. You just have to dispose of it. So it didn't work. Okay. Once you have the data, then you have to do something called model structure selection. So let's say you looked at this model here. Okay, I didn't line them up very good. Let me try to line them up. Okay, so in other words, this is the time you did the step change. And the model looks like this. Okay. And then you look at this and you're trying to say, what kind of model might work here? Well, the first thing you should conclude is the system looks like it has a time delay. right? Because I changed the input here and it didn't change for 20 minutes or whatever it might be. So I bet the model needs a time delay because I can see there's one a time delay there. <laughs> then you're like, oh, system oscillated. It's got to be at least second order. Right? Because no first order system can do that. So I would try second order plus time delay based on knowing what the response of such a system looks like. Okay. All right. So once you decide you have second order plus time delay as your model, then you need a gain, a time delay, a time constant, and a damping coefficient. Those are the parameters of the model. You don't know what they are. You try to find them so they fit the data. Right? So that when you plot your model prediction on top of this data, it's close just like I showed you previously. OK? So that's like regression. We'll talk a little bit about how to do that. And the final thing is, anytime you have a model that's derived from data, it's good to do something called validation. Okay. So you do this test, you get this model, and you get this data, you find a model that maybe does a good job. What do I mean like a good job? Well, I don't know. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? It might look like this. You know. I don't know, it's frequency that's pretty bad. But anyway, I'm not going to draw. You get the idea. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, but then typically what you do is you do a validation test. You go in and test the model for a different input chain. So what if you change this from 5 to 3? Then you get a data set. Then you compare the model that you already have and see if it's any good. OK. There's no guarantee it will be any good. OK. So you know the thing about modeling is if, if I give you a reasonable model, I can fit it to an individual data set, unless it's a really bad choice. It doesn't mean it's going to work for other data sets. So if this model only works for this step change, that's a problem, right? Because what happens if you want to decrease the reflux? Then the model's no good. And if the model's no good, the controller won't work that you design it from. So validation is important. And this is also important when you guys go into lab. Um, it's almost like in this curriculum we should have some kind of data class. You guys never get exposed to like data and how to do use data um, until you get into lab, right? And then you'll say you got this data and know what to do. But um, so this is a good thing to do in lab too, right? If you if you do some modeling on the process you're doing with you, you collect some data that you don't fit you don't fit the model to that data and see if the model still works for it. Whoa. Okay. So now we're going to, with that background in mind, talk about how to find models of interest to us. And the first model of interest to us is the, you know, pretty much the simplest model we talked about, first order, no time delay. Okay. So this is a first order plus time delay model in the Laplace domain. Hopefully you appreciate at this point this is the equivalent of the system in, as a differential equation. These two are completely equivalent to each other. Okay. There's the time constant, there's the gain. If you were to take a Laplace transform of that thing, you get that. If you take inverse Laplace transform, well, you can get that back. All right, we know that if we have a system that looks like this, or equivalently this, and you subject it to a step change of magnitude m, that's the solution. This, I'm just copy this from previous slides. It's nothing new. OK. All right. Sounds good. So let's say you know this is the solution of a first order system to a step change. And so you would like to know um, what k and tau are. That's what you need here. Right? You need to know what k and tau are. All right. <coughs> so you know if this is the solution, this is the solution of your model, 
that where the output starts at zero, right, because it's a deviation variable, the output will end up at Km, right? So if you plot this response, it's an exponential increase from zero up to Km. All right, so you know that. Okay. And so the idea of the, if you wanted to find the gain of your process, okay, assuming it's first order like this, you can calculate where the output went from the data and divide by the magnitude of the input change. Okay, so if we look at this here, it's not a great picture of the visual, but this thing is here what I call delta u. It's the amount you change the input. It's, it's equal to what? 3. Okay. And this thing eventually lines out somewhere, and it started here. And this amount here is called delta y. So if you want to find the gain, all you have to do is divide how much the output changed in the experiment by how much you changed the input, and that's the gain. Does that make sense? Because that's kind of an important principle. Okay. It comes from the solution, because you know when you, this is true, it doesn't even have to be first order. If you, the output, it starts at zero, it eventually goes to Km. Okay. So what is, M, what is K? Well, just take the value Y and divide by M. Okay. That assumes that y starts at zero. If y doesn't start at zero, you just you know you just have to say this is the amount y changed over the amount you change u. That's how you'll always find the gain. Okay. So if you're in a plant or I gave you a problem on a homework or whatever, and I told you the output changed 10 units for two input unit change in, in u, that means the gain is five. 10 divided by two. Okay. All right. So the gain is always calculated this way. Take your data. Find out how much the output changed. You change u yourself, so you should definitely know what delta u is. Divide the two, get the gain. Okay. Now, here, for the sake of, um, I guess, completeness, I'll show you how you should not find the time constant. Okay. And for reasons I'll explain. So let's say you want to find the time constant. So what am I, what am I doing here? I'm rearranging this equation to be y over km, and then I'm taking the derivative of this. So hopefully you get that if I divide this by y over km, then I'm left with this. And if I take the derivative of this, you know, ddt, uh, you cancel the 1, you get this, right? And then if you evaluate this thing at time equals 0, this thing at time equals 0, you get 1 over tau. You might say, OK. So what does that mean? That means if I can draw a tangent line to the solution at time equals 0, its slope will be 1 over tau. And that means I can get tau as the inverse of that. So the picture looks like this. Okay. Again, I've just replicated from the previous slide what we have here. So here's your response, right? So we're, we're plotting here time. This is from the book. So they want to scale time by tau. Fine. They want to scale y by cam. So it's going to go to 0 to 1. The solution looks like this. <coughs> right. So it goes 0. Then it goes up to 1. Scaled or cam. The real value of y. Um, and so if you're really good, right, you could draw a tangent line down here. I can't do this. Okay, even with a ruler. And you draw a tangent line, see when it crosses here, and then this value here is tau. It just uses this equation here. Okay. So why is this a bad idea? Uh, it's a bad idea because uh, this is not how data looks. Um, so if you were to look at real data in a real plan, <coughs> you would, you know, do your experiment. So here's your U of P versus P. P your step change looks good. Um, here's your Y of P versus time. So it's going to look like this. Noisy. Okay, I, I, I don't even know how to find the tangent to the time equals. I don't even know when it start, started changing, right? Like, did it start changing there? I'm not really totally sure. And I'm, I'm certainly not going to be able to draw a tangent line to this. This is not very practical. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. Luckily, there's a better way. Um, and the better way is this. If you were to take this solution and evaluate this thing at t equal tau, 
you would find that this number here is 0.632. Okay. So what does that mean? It means the output reaches 63.2% of its final value at when t equals tau. Okay. So that means you can come up to this response line here. You know where it started. You know where it ended. So you can find when it's 63.2% complete. And that value is tau. That's going to be a lot easier. It's not perfect, right? But I have no way to draw a tangent line, but I can probably get some idea that, you know, it started here, and this is about 63%, and that distance there is tau. It's more robust to the noise and stuff in the data. Okay. All right. So if someone said, how do you find a time constant for a first order system, you would do it by finding this. It, it, there's nothing magical about 63.2%. You could plug in 2 tau, and you'd find, I don't know, that's 80-something percent. Find when it's 80-something percent, and that's 2 tau. Okay, but just uh, people would typically use it when it's tau. Okay? So in other words, find the gain like this, divide the amount you change the, uh, uh, the, the amount, the output change divided by the amount you change the input to find the gain, and then find the time constant for the 63 percent. Then you, got, you have your model. Then it'd be a good idea to plot your model versus the data to see if it agrees. Obviously, your model is going to look a lot smoother, right? It's going to look like this. But, you know, you'd say that's, that's good. Right. Okay. So that's easy enough. So here's a little example. So 